Right. Hello, everyone. I'm Song from Bloomberg, and I'm here to talk to you today about reliable airflow DAG design when building a time series data lake house, a story about how we were able to fulfill the complex reliability requirements of date partitioned lake house ingestion through the use of airflow. So at Bloomberg, we maintain live streams of financial data through time. And recently, uh, there has been a growing interest in the financial sector to acquire historical data to backtest quantitative models to verify the success of their trading strategies. And we provide the service by ingesting date partition data into the cloud in a lake house. And while that might sound somewhat manageable to you, what makes it all the more difficult are human expectations. Human expectations when accessing a time series data store can be verbalized like the one you see on the screen. Daily, starting Tuesday, September 19, 2023, today, uh, between 5.30 PM and 7.30 PM EDT. And a simple statement like this encapsulates various different elements of reliability requirements. The start date and time from which the user will start to expect seeing the data set available on the lake house, the recurrence pattern, the frequency with which they will expect to see updates to the data day over day with new data, and the expected delivery window they will expect to acquire those updates. And these human expectations are incredibly important to honor because the if these reliability requirements are not fulfilled, the outcome is simply that the data will not be there when you expect it. And this is going to make your users very mad uh, because they're not going to be able to run that awesome time series model that they built with your data that they're paying money for with today's new data point that they were hoping to make a game time decision. Why wouldn't they be mad, right? So we have a vested interest in fulfilling these re reliability requirements and meet these human expectations. And if you didn't realize already, this sort of schedule-based, timetabled expectation is starting to look incredibly airflowy. So now that you understand what reliability re requirements look like for accessing a time series data store, let's talk about what building for reliability looks like on an Airflow DAG. We'll talk about recoverability, ensuring that the DAGs and the individual tasks themselves can be rerun and are safe to do so. We'll talk about scalability. Are our reliability requirements going to be fulfilled when our system scales out to thousands of DAGs? And finally, my most favorite subject, uh, failure and delay detection, uh, to alert on failures and delays when they happen, as soon as they happen, so someone can jump in and remediate the situation. So recoverability. A simple data lake house ingestion workflow can be expressed by a simple DAG like this. You might have a sensor that checks the existence and availability of some source data that your transformation requires. And then you'll kick off a more, much more expensive process, maybe a Spark transformation sitting on Kubernetes cluster somewhere and ingesting into the lake house. And in this simple DAG, we might have different failure scenarios. The sensor could fail, your transformation task could fail, Regardless, it's going to be important for us to design our DAG to be recovery friendly so that these tasks will eventually succeed when these underlying issues are resolved. So a common mistake in ingesting time series or date partition data into a lake house is querying for the latest data when you're fetching the data. And this becomes a problem, especially if your task doesn't succeed when it is supposed to, when you're expecting it to. Because let's say a task that was supposed to succeed today to fetch today's data might instead succeed tomorrow because of a day-long airflow cluster outage. Then what data do we have and that we have ingested onto the 19th, the 20th, right? So in order to make this task item potent, what we can do is use some sense of time when you select and filter on your query where you're fetching the data. And a natural way to do this in Airflow is to combine this with, and connect it to the concept of data interval, which is set deterministically on the Airflow DAG by the timetable that is defined on it. And similarly, we can use this timetable related sense of time to determine the right partition in your own open table format 
so that the task will consistently absorb into the same date partition that it is re responsible for, no matter how many days later you're going to be rerunning the task. So next up, let's make the task uh, atomic. And this can be a challenge in the world of big data when each write is responsible for many different files. So what does it mean to be atomic? We're trying to make it behave as close to a transaction as possible. To start off with, we could utilize snapshot isolation in your write operation to ensure that no in-between states are exposed to other writers and readers while your task is writing to the lake house. Next, we can use a write optimized lake house partition strategy where you're intentionally choosing a partitioning strategy on your table that aligns with the ingestion frequency of your DAG. So in this specific example, we're choosing a daily partition in the lake house that aligns with the daily ingestion pattern of your airflow DAG. And this in turn allows us to utilize lake house operations that replaces an entire partition atomically. And what this does is, for this, if this ta task reruns anytime in the future, it will atomically replace this specific day's data in your lake house in a single transaction. So no in-between states, again, and no duplicate records can be found at any time by anyone accessing the table. And finally, this is pretty simple. Uh, now that our tasks are safe to retry, we're just going to enable automatic retries. Uh, and in Airflow, this is as simple as setting the retries parameter on your task at the task level, which will immediately requeue a failed task uh, for it to have a, a chance of succeeding uh, on future runs. We can also invoke a retry manually by clearing a task, which allows you to retry a task in any state. And that might be relevant to you. Let's say if your task has originally succeeded, but a few hours later, a downstream team lets you know that there was a data quality issue that was introduced in your output file. In this case, you would have to retry the task manually. Let's talk about scalability. I am particularly interested in talking about this from the perspective of resource optimization. Uh, so ETL processes for late cast ingestions and transformations tend to be very expensive. In our case, we launched a Spark job in a Kubernetes cluster that requires many RAM, many cores of uh, resources to map all these data sets together and transform. This makes it all the more important that we launch our compute intensive tasks when we know that the source dependencies that we require for the job are available. Because if we don't, we will have to hog these expensive resources for the entire lifetime of our expected delivery window. And we live in a very dynamic environment where not just our output has the expected delivery period, but so does our source data. So this is where sensors come in. Uh, this is sort of Airflow 101, but sensors allow you to check for certain conditions uh, to be met before launching the rest of your job. In this case, it allows us to detect that all the source data sets that are required for the ETL process are available before kicking off the more expensive task. So sensors are already great, but a nitpicky drawback of sensors is that they take up an entire worker slot and are executed as a single task and are kept alive as a single task. So it's great, but maybe not ideal for something that's just periodically polling and doesn't require a lot of compute. Now there's a specific subset of sensors that I think are worth paying attention to, known as the asynchronous sensors. Asynchronous sensors, or deferrable operators, uh, leverage the power of asynchronous Python programming to execute looped IO-bound callbacks within a single Python process known as the triggerer. And if these are written well, a single triggerer process can handle thousands of these callbacks uh, to check for conditions, which means that you're not incurring much overhead onto the airflow cluster. So here is my poor stop motion diagram of the asynchronous sensor at work. The worker picks up the asynchronous sensor uh, momentarily only to queue it up as a trigger that gets picked up by the triggerer process. The trigger process 
uh, handles many different triggers, periodically checking that each of these triggers conditions have been met. When one of the triggers condition have been met, it is taken out of the trigger, and an event is sent back to the worker, which picks it up momentarily, only to mark the sensor as being successful. So in this simple workflow, you can already understand how little of the worker's capacity an asynchronous sensor incurs. OK, let's talk about failure and delay detection. Again, here is a simple diagram of our lake acid ingestion workflow. And a number of things could go wrong here. The Kubernetes Spark job operator could fail for a number of different reasons. Uh, the source data sensing task could fail also for a number of different reasons. And when it does, a good way to be alerted on this is by using the unfailure callback uh, that can be defined at the task level. What this does is you define a callable function of your choice that will be invoked when the task fails. And good examples of common use cases for these are sending an email to a stake owner who is very in invested in ensuring that the task succeeds, or leaving an informative record in a database of your choice that helps you keep track of how many times a task instance failed and for what reasons. But on second thought, I think some of these failure scenarios are better categorized as delays. What's the difference? I think the distinction here is that delays doesn't really lead to immediate exception in the tasks, and, since, uh, and hence leave the task in valid running states. So if they're in valid running states, they don't result in a failure callback, how do we know when a delay happens? There is a concept of timeout in Airflow which is defined either at the DAG run or the task level, which sets an upper bound to the length of life a task instance can have. And when this is breached, the task instance is killed by force. Because it is killed by force, a failure callback is invoked. Is that what we want? Maybe. But in a lot of cases, when we want to detect delays, we simply want to detect the delay, execute some callback, let an accountable owner know, but leave the task alive because we want to give it a chance at succeeding. We don't want it to fail uh, and lead to possibly just pausing the entire DAG. So that brings us to the idea of SLAs, also known as service level agreement uh, in the world of reliability engineering. It is a bit of a loaded term there, but what it means within Airflow is the concept of setting an expected time of completion after which a specific callback will be executed. And it sort of works that way uh, with a lot of confusion and a lot of flaws. And this is my attempt at giving you a one minute brief of this analysis. So listen very closely. So uh, on the slide there are a few components of the Airflow infrastructure. The DAC file processor process is a Python process that creates other ephemeral short-lived processes known as DAC file processor process. These processes read the DAC files, detect changes on them, and make updates in the database about any, any changes that the DAGs might have had to reflect the current state of the DAGs. What the SLA feature does is it hijacks this primary responsibility of the DAC file processing process and requests that it executes these SLAs using 170 lines of code. And it does this every time the DAC file processor process parses these DAGs. So in my humble opinion, this was such an unnecessarily confusing architecture for a computation that I thought should look as simple as this, where we're just simply comparing the current time with the summation of the SLA uh, uh, and the start time of the task. And I wasn't alone in this confusion. Over the last five years, there were a large number of users reporting issues about the SLA feature, writing blog posts about them, uh, leading efforts to try to fix the feature. But given that the feature was perhaps started off with a troubling foundation, uh, attempts to patch the SLA feature often led to more patches and more issues. Some people on the community questioned if it was usable at all. So we, even though we went through all this effort to understand exactly how it worked and what the kinks were, we weren't really confident about the future of SLAs to 
uh, use it as a reliability feature. So some are reasons as to why it's a poor feature is that it's unclear if the DAG, if it's a DAG level or a task level feature. Here you see that the SLA is defined at the task level, but the callback itself is defined at the DAG level. The function signature is vastly different from the other callbacks. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the task level failure uh, callback and the DAG level success callback, all taking in the task instance context as your argument. On the right-hand side, you see the SLA callback that takes a set of five very specific arguments that have been form-fitted over time to try to make this feature work uh, because it doesn't have access to the most appropriate task instance context when it's invoked. So what other options do we have? I credit much of our solution to this person, Malfi, uh, on the community who suggested that we use deferrable operators uh, that launch date time triggers, which we sort of just talked about right now, right? So this is how it works. We have a custom deferrable operator called the SLA monitor, uh, which takes the SLA, the callback function that we want to execute, and the target task ID uh, that we want to monitor with this specific task. And what happens is it spins up at the beginning of the DAG as a standalone deferrable operator. It quickly pauses itself and defers uh, to spin up a daytime trigger, which measures an hour from, from then. And when um, after an hour is measured, uh, it sends a signal back to the SLA monitor to say, hey, come back alive. Let's check if the sensor that we're monitoring has succeeded by then. And if it has, it just quietly exits. But if the sensor that we are monitoring is still running and has missed the SLA, what it does is execute this callback at this single point in time. So you can see here that instead of hijacking a different process and constantly checking if these SLAs have missed, we're checking it at one single point in time, which is very intuitive to what we would want to do. Here's an example of the SLA monitor in action. We have a single SLA monitor in this DAG that is designed to monitor the SLA of the source file sensor, which is a sensor that, again, detects that the uh, source data that we need for the transformation have become available. And if this sensor misses this SLA, we actually want to be really smart about it. We want to send an alert to the owners of these data sets and just forget about it. Uh, so let's see what the SLA monitor does when it runs. Just like we discussed, it comes up as a standalone process. It quickly defers itself, starts a date time temporal trigger that keeps track of an hour from then, 1830 to 1930. And 1930 exactly it sends an event back to the worker. The worker picks up the deferred SLA monitor and at this single point in time checks if the sensor has succeeded by then. In this example, it hasn't, executes the SLA miss callback. And since this specific callback is defined for this specific task and we have access to the task instance context and its rich information, we're able to print out and spoon feed this amazing information to the person that we're alerting. Uh, regarding what they're supposed to pay attention to. So on an ending note, we've been very delighted at how customizable, scalable, and predictable these SLA monitoring solution has been. Here we have an example of two SLA monitors, each tracking the SLA of two separate tasks uh, with two separate callback functions defined on them. So SLA monitor A, which senses the SLA of the sensor, might again send an email to the owners of those data sets whereas the generic callback might keep track of uh, and leave records in a database about how many times we have missed uh, our users' SLAs. And if the SLA monitors were deferred for longer uh, than the main workflow uh, on the top, we could make use of a custom teardown operator that sets the tasks of the supplementary SLA monitoring tasks to success state, so the overall state of the Dagron can be taken down as having been successful because we have nothing to monitor the SLAs for anymore so that it can be taken out of the scheduler loop. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.